It's time to search my parents' house. One single book had seemed to append everything I knew about time and space. What else did they have hiding in here? Both had been professors, but neither in theology. My father was a professor of English literature, and my mother was a physicist for fuck's sake. It made no sense. Or maybe a lot of sense. I was still a bit too shaken to figure things out, and my hand still burned like Satan's hemorrhoids. I walked absentmindedly to the top of the stairs, sat on the first step, and started riffling through the book. I didn't know if I wanted to find the text exactly the same, or find that it had inexplicably vanished. I had no idea which one would make more sense. That's not true. I wanted to find the text. I wanted to discover the strange. Something was calling me. I wanted to answer it. I found it. Randomly allocated throughout the book was the advice that I had been given. Reading through it made little sense, as the narrative was not punctuated by real-time demon wrangling and pants shitting. So, the narrative had been there the whole fucking time, penned and published god knows how many years before my birth. I don't know what to take from this. I resolved to pick my way through the whole book. It was at least a thousand pages, but there clearly lay answers within. I snapped it closed and walked downstairs, planning the time that I would set aside to read it. My dead parents were in the kitchen. Mom was played out on the table, skin pallid and torso strewn open like a dropped taco. Dad was behind the table, checkered napkin around his neck, hands working furiously with his knife and fork. He was eating my mom's intestines. His face was grinning with ghoulish delight as he pumped back and forth with his knife, cutting through gristle and bone. The lower half of his face was covered in blood. He continued to pump rhythmically as he slowly raised his head to meet my gaze. Without breaking eye contact, he pulled out a gelatinous piece of cartilage with his fork and passed it to my mother. She took the fork in her mouth and slowly began to auto-cannibalize herself. Then she, too, pivoted her gaze at me and grinned. One of her eye sockets was empty. I screamed, or at least tried to, and slammed into the cupboard behind me. I fell on the floor with a crash as the cupboard door burst open and pots and pans rained down on top of me. I shot back to my feet, dazed, and grabbed wildly for the watch, the rosary, anything. I reached into my pocket, but my hands only found the car keys. I waved them in front of me fruitlessly, as though they were a talisman that could protect me from the horror I had just seen. I focused my eyes on the scene in front of me. Nothing was on the table. I was alone in the room, with the only motion coming from a lone, swirling tin lid to a forgotten pen. Perhaps demon hunting was going to prove more difficult than I thought. I sat on the couch in the living room with a steaming cup of chamomile tea by my side. It's hard to say if this act of mimicking my parents' habits was intentional or not, but perhaps imitating them wasn't as bad as I thought when I was 17. The book lay open on my lap. I didn't bother hunting for a page. I just opened it up near the front and began reading. That scene must have shocked you, Peter. You were attacked by a demon upstairs, and it damaged you in ways that weren't physical. 
you must realize by now that everything you saw was in your head, but that doesn't make it less real. You need to find a way to heal yourself, or the damage might permanently affect your untrained mind. I snapped the book shut. Nothing like mom's soothing advice to comfort you when you're down. I paced the room. I was at one hell of a crossroad. If I continued to pursue my parents, things would just keep getting deeper. There'd be no going back. I found myself wondering what led my parents to whatever decision they must have faced. I imagined them discussing their fate. I could see my father pointing out that fear of death creates something that never existed before and that this fear was its own kind of demon. My mother, in her infinite logic, would have responded that death itself was real regardless of our actions and that every human birth is nothing more than a delayed death sentence. They were right, of course, and if chose not to follow now, it would not save my life. I was going to die at some point, and when the time came, the only thing I would have left was the ability to say I did that. I crossed back to the couch and opened the book. Start with the smallest demon, son. My father's advice ended the chapter and gave me no more insight. What. The. Fuck. I racked my brain to think of what that meant. When had my father ever talked about a demon? I was crying. Buster Duncan had punched me, hard, and taken three of my best G.I. Joes. He had squeezed my neck until I denounced ownership. When he let me go, I ran home at a full sprint. In a rare moment of near-human compassion, my father had hugged me as I cried. He's the worst kid in the world, Dad. He makes me feel so small. He's a demon! I gasped through sobs. Well, son, don't be controlled by him. If this is the way that he lives his life, if hurting other kids makes him happy, then he really is the smallest kid in the world. Buster Duncan was the worst piece of shit that I knew growing up. He lived to cause anguish to other kids. Despite my father's assurances, he was significantly larger than anyone else in our class, on account of being held back a grade on two separate occasions. I had the great fortune of growing up on the same street as him. I wondered if he still lived in the same dump at the end of the road. What did idiots do when they grew up? I made it to the house in under five minutes. It looked worse than it had when I was a kid. Past the three rusted autos and the elegant collection of weeds sat the screen door. It reeked of stale cigarettes and sadness. I knocked and heard a grumbling from within. His mother, who looked miserable just to be alive and angry for having to face a visitor, waddled to the threshold. Crumbs stumbled from her mumu. Yeah she offered in a way of greeting. Hi, um, Mrs. Duncan. I'm an old uh, friend of Buster's from his childhood. Could he... Um, could I see him? She eyed me suspiciously for several awkward seconds. He's out back, she finally croaked in a cigarette-stained voice. I followed awkwardly through the ramshackle home and toward the back porch. She sat back down on the couch. Buster Duncan stood smiling in the backyard, which was little more than a dirt patch carved from the surrounding woods. He was bigger and fatter than ever. But more than that, I could tell that he was still just mean. The look was unmistakable from anyone who had been pounded by a jerk as a kid. Buster, I said descending the porch steps slowly and deliberately. I don't know if you remember me. Peter, I offered. I came to a stop in the dirt, ten feet in front of him. You used to call me faggot lips. His smile was as unwavering as it was stupid. 
I came here to tell you something. To exorcise a demon, if you will. I clutched the pocket watch in my left pocket and the rosary in my right. You made me afraid to walk down the street when I was younger. I had so many bruises on my arms in elementary school that Child Protective Services actually showed up to question my parents about beating me. I gave a wan smile. I think CPS decided it was impossible that anyone as boring as them could even make a fist. His glare was unchanging, his hands clenching and unclenching. But it was more than that. I went on, my voice cracking just a little. You made me afraid to be. You made me think that there was something so inherently ugly and wrong with being Peter that I deserved it. It might just sound like childhood bullying, but it wrecked my self-esteem, which made me think I was weak and therefore deserved it even more. I didn't realize until years later that you were the one who was wrong. My breath hitched and the beginning of a sob escaped my lips. And that I could not keep you from being small. I could only choose whether or not to feel smaller. So I want to say something I should have long ago. I advanced until I was two feet away from him and I leveled with his chest. I forgive you. Truly. I sighed. I choose to exorcise this demon. It was then that I realized his eyes were yellow. The demon screamed and swung at me. I was too shocked to pull either item from my pocket and simply stared agape as his fist made contact with my chin and bounced harmlessly off. He shrieked and started clawing at me with essentially no effect. My sleeves were slightly ruffled. I could only gawk in confusion as it became more and more agitated, swinging harder and harder in a fruitless endeavor. It let out a final scream, erupted into flames, and turned to sprint into the woods. The only thing that came to my confused mind was shock at just how small it was as it receded into the darkness. I turned back to face the house, imagining that his mother would emerge to investigate the noise. She didn't. I finally turned back around and saw something in the dirt that I had not noticed before. It was a granite marker. I approached it. Buster Duncan, born 11079, died 1913. Nothing more was written. I stared in silence for some time. Finally, I opened the book. The page was the last paragraph of a chapter. There are many ways to go out into the world and face the demons that haunt its son. Those are the ones that may destroy your body. This is how your mother and I met our physical end. Never, ever forget that any battle worth fighting is one that you may very well lose. But it is impossible, completely impossible, to kill any one of them while a demon still lives inside. No weapon will work. Which is why I should tell you now that the demon you sent back into the hole was not harmed just vanished, and he is likely quite angry with you. Be forewarned, and know that we're proud. Of all the things in the whole fucking book, it was the last sentence that caused the greatest impact. As I turned the page with my right hand, I realized that it didn't hurt anymore. I smiled. The next chapter was entitled Into the Woods. I frowned. It was almost dark. I remember thinking, as a child, that heroes going on great adventures must feel no fear, that the only reason they struck out in the first place was because they knew they were empowered in a way that made them ready to face any challenge, and that the reason people listening to their stories trembled in fear 
is because they were listening and not doing. The greatest of hunters, I had decided, simply were not afraid. I realized, as I climbed cautiously into those twilled woods with nothing but a book, a watch and some beads, that I had been full of shit. I was terrified. It's in the dustiest books that you may find in the best stories. Mm-hmm.